Last month we talked about our consecration and sanctification. But every meeting he's building upon each one. You know? And why? Because he's trying, he, he wants to prepare you for your wedding day. And we all have a wedding to attend, but most in the church don't know we have a wedding to attend. And if they do know we have a wedding to attend, they think it's automatic. That's not. You might be a guest at the wedding, but you won't be the bride. Not every, and it, I should qualify that by the choices we make. To be the bride, not everybody in the body is the bride. But everybody but the bride is a part of the body. So there's a wedding, and that's what these meetings are about, to help us to know what it looks like to be dressed in our wedding garments. And so uh, last month, we talked about our consecration and our sanctification. We looked at the three main stages of salvation. We broke that out, that there's, it would be better to call salvation full salvation because getting saved is just the beginning. It's not the end result. That first Peter 1 Peter 1.9 says that to receive the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So there's a beginning of our faith and an end result. There's a beginning of our salvation and an end of our salvation. And the end of our salvation is to become the bride, to be purified to his standards on this earth today. It's not something that takes place once we die. It's too late then. <laughs> you don't want to waste the time you have now. So we kind of broke out and looked in detail. The three stages that I try, I'm not saying they're the main stages that the Lord has helped me over the years. And the first stage is justification. We looked at sanctification and we looked at glorification. And you see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. It'll show you those that's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm not going to, I'm just recapping last month real quickly. But that gives you the justification. It shows that the next stage is what I call stage two, the sanctification. And the third stage is the glorification. So every believer, when we're saved, we're justified by faith. That's the first stage. Second stage is the sanctification. That's this bigger period that once we're saved, we, that doesn't cost us anything. But now, to go through the purification cost, of, it will cost us our flesh if we're willing to die to self. And that's the purification process. So that's the sanctification period. It's what I call stage two of our salvation. And stage three, in those verses you see, is to go on to the glorification. And that's what the Lord is, and Holy Spirit has sent ever each and every one of us, that we go on to the glory. But you're never going to go to the glory. You'll never make it to stage three. This is just truth. If you're not willing to go through the purification process. And I gave the example of Esther um, last month. That, and they had, a, and to be appointed king, the queen, all of them went through purification process, and only then was she enthroned to sit next to the king. But there was a there's a process of purification that had to take place. It wasn't just automatic. Nobody could just rush in to go be with the king. You know, it took time, and you you need to be prepared. And so it is like with our walk. And so ultimately, stage three is the glorification, and that means. For everyone who's willing to go through that process of being purified, it means that you'll be filled with the glory. And that's who his bride will be in the last days. You know, he's after a bride to rule and reign with him, to bring in the harvest, and to help set the captives free. You know, we have a huge harvest and a lot of work to do in the church. So he's, he's looking for people who are willing to make themselves ready. And so we broke down consecration and sanctification and consecration and sanctification they're both separating us from something consecration is our role those are our choices that we make to be holy as he is holy they're just our yes it's just our surrendering our will it isn't always necessarily sin it's choices we make and I gave examples of that last month in my own walk and that's our role the sanctification is the sanctifier. It's only the work he can do and Holy Spirit can do. And that the sanctifier sanctifies us, we said, with truth. So we know that truth and how much we embrace truth is a key to how well we'll become prepared for our wedding day and how well we'll walk through that purification process. And so we also looked at um, that that's a process every believer should be going through. Everyone. We should be walking in this process of going from not just being saved and living what I would consider a selfish life unto self. You might live a good moral life. You might make it to heaven. But that was never why he died for us. It was to go on to the glory. He wants everyone to be the bride. He wants everyone. It's, it, in the bride, 
just so we're clear on this, it's not gender-based. It's talking about spiritual maturity. Just like interchangeably as the sons of God and the overcomers. Sons of God, same thing. It's, it's speaking of relationship and our commitment to the bridegroom king. How deep are we willing to go? So stage three is what brings us to that place in him. And it's a process. It's a journey. And it's, it's also, it's that process that changes us from one degree of glory to the next that 2 Corinthians 3.18 speaks about. We're changed, first of all, it says, by what you behold. What you behold, you become. It's a spiritual law and principle. So if you're beholding this world, you're going to become like this world. And you're going to be distracted and not miss, you're going to miss your destiny. But if you behold the things of God, we get changed by one degree of glory after another. And I encourage you to go look at those scriptures because they're encouraging. Because the Lord doesn't just start a process, but it says until it's completed. So if you're willing, he'll complete that process in you. And it's also what is called, um, that we, when we die to ourselves, it's called to take up our cross. It's what I, what I call living the crucified life that Paul lived um, magnificently, and his word speaks of. So we also look that, that uh, God's plan was to sanctify us, spirit, mind, and body, all three to come into alignment with his perfect will. Not just our spirit, and we're going to talk more about our soul and our body today, but he wants all three to come into alignment. And that's the struggle that every person goes through. How do we get there? What does that look like? And we're going to look at that more today. But ultimately he wants to do that because to receive the end result of our faith, the salvation of our soul, we also looked at that we need to live a consecrated life 100%. Anything less, you won't be in that position to be qualified. So there are choices we make in our life. How much do we consider him worth knowing? And we also looked at Elijah's life. And we looked at we looked at King Ahab and how he married Jezebel, brought compromise and mixture, and how it was a pretty lethal mixed marriage. Brought, brought in a lot of evil, a lot of destruction. We looked at how Jezebel destroyed the true prophets of God. And we also looked at, and we talked about how Jezebel's alive and living in the church today. Very much so. She's pretty much ruling the Lord's church at large, in the nations. We need to be aware of that. And... It's no different today with her. And the reason Jezebel is alive, at least with Elijah, you know, he was bold when we looked at that. He confronted sin. We don't have very many people in the church confronting sin like Elijah did. So we're even worse off than it was with, with, when it was with Elijah's day. But the good news is, is that we talked about He's got a company of people that he's preparing that will be the warrior bride, the Ezra bride, that's the Hebrew, that has a militant context to it. That's, he's preparing this day, and that true church, that bride, is going to finish the work that Elijah failed to do. The one thing he failed to do that we can see in Scripture is he failed to slay Jezebel. Slayed all the other prophets, but he forgot to get rid of the root. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the roots today. <laughs> and so... Um, but that was the good news. The last day's church is going to deal with Jezebel. We need to know there's a real war. It isn't he just all did it on the cross, and I hear people say some of the most crazy things to me. Oh, just pray real quietly, and Jesus will take care of everything. Well, no. He has a church that he gave authority to, and he'll work through his church. And so we need to know that we're in a real battle here, and that the bride... She's going to destroy the works of Jezebel. She's going to set the captives free, bringing the Lord's harvest in. And it's why our consecration and sanctification is so critical in our walk. Why I can see, you know, we broke it down and we looked at it, the choices we made. And it's why it's so important and critical because it will help prepare us to be the bride. It will help us to be the overcomer. When we understand our role, his role, that we, can, we get to decide then. Is it worth it? Do we want to... Do we want it? He won't force it on anybody. But we have to at least understand what's happening to be even be able to make that choice. So we were looking at that in detail. And 
if we're not willing to go through the process. We need to know that Jezebel's going to just slaughter us. She already is. There's too many casualties in the church due to Jezebel right now. And Jezebel was the main spirit principality that brought in um, homosexuality, the debauchery, the sexual sin in the church. And, and that's why it's rampant. That's why we see homosexual sexuality allowed in the pulpit. I, I love the people, but I will not be afraid and coward. And the sin is an abomination to the Lord. You know, those people are in bondage. We love them, but they're deceived. And so, but now we see them in the church. We've got pastors and teachers. And it's just, and so of course what you allow here spreads to the body. So we looked at, um, we looked at that and the, we looked at how the church is full of mixture. And that's why there's so many casualties to Je Jezebel. Because most are not willing. Well, actually, I, I, I hardly ever run into any that are willing to be bold and confront sin like Elijah did. You know, how many are willing to go up to the leaders in church and say, what are you doing? Why are you allowing this in? When we know it goes against the word of God. You know, so that's the main reason we're full of mixture and compromise. We've allowed it. It's saturated our lives, and there's some reasons that we're not even aware of why we have it. You know, things we've just been born into, the culture. We've talked about those things, too, in these meetings. But, but it was why... Our consecration is so important, and, our, and, our, and when we make those choices, then the sanctifier can come in and start to purify us. When we just make the choice and yield, then the sanctifier and Holy Spirit resurrection power comes and starts purifying that area of our lives that we're willing to yield to. And it's, it's a process, and it's not easy, and it's often painful, but it's worth it. And... We looked at, too, how we need to come to that place that Elijah came in, where he was in a place of consecration, but he was also in a place of brokenness. After his greatest victory, he ran in fear, and he ran for his life, and it wasn't in the wind, it wasn't in the earthquake, and it wasn't in the fire, but it was in the quietness that he heard the Lord's voice. So our brokenness is a key to hearing God's voice clearly. And when I say brokenness, I mean our humbleness before him. I all use brokenness two ways. We're broken people that keep breaking people. We're going to look at that today in a little bit more detail. But then there's a brokenness that just comes. And it doesn't mean you're destroyed. It just means you have nothing. You just, you're there. And that's when, you, that's when we really hear the clear voice of God. Most in the church are not in that place. And as I mentioned last time, you can tell a broken person when you meet them. You know, they've been through a lot. They've been through a lot. And, but they have, they're, they're, they have a humbleness to them. And they're just broken before the Lord. And they'll heal. They'll do whatever the Lord says. But that's where we hear the voice. And so, and that voice is wanting to call us out of Babylon. You know, so, and why? So that we'll know his perfect will. And most don't know his, his perfect will. Very few know his perfect will in the body of Christ, and that's really sad. And so it goes back to those choices we made. Consecration, sanctification. So the last thing we looked at, you know, Paul said that a little leaven in Galatians, I believe it was Galatians 5, 9, says a little leaven leavens the whole loaf. And I love the Amplify because it says, you can basically translate it, a little sin perverts the whole church. We really need to know what the Word of God teaches us. And we really not need to know how serious it is. So just a little bit of sin, when we allow it into the church, what it pollutes the whole church. It's why people will hear, until I have no more breath to speak, the Lord will tolerate zero tolerance. Zero tolerance for compromise and mixture in his body. He's separating the wheat and the tares. He's going to do a purifying work. It's not too late. Now's the time. Let the refiner's fire come. You want to let that, that stuff come up and out of you, but zero tolerance because it destroys the whole batch. And we're guilty as this church for allowing it in. So that was a recap. If you're interested, all the teachings are on the ministry website, thevoiceofmybeloved.com. They're also on the ministry YouTube channel that you can go back and take a look at. And the good, the good news is, is I shared you can catch up. And the Lord is really building upon these. And I could see his hand in this last month when he gave me the message. 
And it, that was the only time he ever told me what I was going to do this month. I didn't have the full message. But I, but I could see his hand in it because consecration and sanctification, it was helping us understand breaking out. We're called to be the bride. We're called to fill, be filled with the glory. It's for everybody. He's not a respected person. But how do we walk that out in our day-to-day -day life? What does that look like for us as individuals as we go through our, our hard, pressed down, shaken places? And you can, someone can say that to you, but you're blue in the face, and it can mean nothing to them. You know, because the reality is, is it's truth, but we all walk through some really tough stuff in life. And the Lord wants to redeem it all. That's his heart. His heart is a heart of gold. And to redeem. He's a God of redemption. But if we don't know that what we're suffering is meant to be redemptive, and it's meant to qualify us to be the overcomers, because it's only the overcomers that are going to sit next to him on his throne. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit beside me on my throne as I myself overcame and sat down beside my father on his throne. That's a promise only for the overcomers, not everybody. So he allows these things, and everything's not by accident. It's all his custom design test setting us up, wanting to qualify us to become the overcomer. To sit, he wants everybody to sit by him, next to him on his throne. But the truth is, he will only have the lamb's wife next to him, the bride. Not everyone, not everyone sits next to the bridegroom king. So he's got a process. His ways are perfect. So today we're going to go deeper into this. And... Today, the message is, I want to share more about this process and how it directly affects our transformation. Today's message is a little bit more nuts and bolts of just practical, how do we do this walk if we're to be the overcomer? That I don't hear too much of this teaching out there from anybody. Few. And so we need real answers based on the Word of God, what that looks like in, it, in our walk. So today's message is kind of more of a mechanic, more nuts and bolts. And how do we do this, but building on each one, but why ultimately to prepare us for our wedding day. And so today's message is called Preparing the Overcomers, the Renewal of Our Mind, Key to Our Transformation. So we're going to look at the process of the renewal of our mind and what that looks like. Because that's a vital key for if we're to overcome, if we're to qualify. And before I go too much into that, if you brought your Bibles, I'd like to take a look at the Word. And let's turn and look at and read Luke chapter 8 and verses 5 through 15. It's, it's the Lord's parable on the sea and how it fell on different soils. And let's just take a look at that together. Starting in verse 5, chapter 8. It says, The sower went out to sow seed, and he sowed and was trodden underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up, and some seed fell on the rock, and as soon as it sprouted, it withered away because it had no moisture. And other seed fell in the midst of the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it, and it choked it off. And some seed fell into good soil and grew up and yielded a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him be listening, and let him consider and understand by hearing. And when his disciples asked him the meaning of this parable, he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mysteries and secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that through looking they may not see, and hearing they may not comprehend. Now the meaning of the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those along the traveled road are the people who have heard. Then the devil comes and carries away the message out of their hearts, that they may not believe. And those upon the rock are the people who, when they hear the word, receive and welcome it, with joy, but they have no root. They believe for a while in a time of trial and temptation, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, these are the people who hear, 
But as they go on their way, they are choked and suffocated with the anxieties and cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not ripen. But as for the seed in the good soil, these are the people who, hearing of word, hold it fast in a just, noble, virtuous, and worthy heart, and steadily, steadily bring forth fruit with patience. So we see in this parable the Lord's giving us some different soil that seed can fall upon and what happens to it. We see some felt on the traveled path. That would be pretty much the world, those who reject the truth. They don't, they hear it, but they don't want it. They're not interested. Some fell on rocks. We see it had no root. So when hard times came along, they weren't able to stand. And they, and they quit. They gave up. We see some fell in thorns, and they heard it, and they were too busy with the world, too busy with this world's ways of doing things, anxieties, the busyness. It choked them. It suffocated them. It didn't produce fruit. But we see there's hope here. God always is a God of hope and encouragement. And we see it in, in, in the last example. It, some fell on good soil. And then this one says, and it yielded a crop a hundred times. I know Matthew talks about 116, 30 fold, but this one, when the hundred percent is the bride. And all of it's talking about believers in Matthew, because it was good soil too. It said 160 and 30, and that was all good soil. And so this says it, it reaped a hundred a hundred percent, a hundred times what was sown. And so they heard the word. But when they heard it, they also, it says, they brought forth fruit with patience. So patience is a key in this process of our walk and of transformation, of being renewed. And so, you know, God has a dream. Did you know that? Did you ever think about that? He has a dream. He wants his family back. He wants us restored back to that intimate place of relationship that we've lost at large. That's his dream. You know, what does family mean to you when I say family? For some, it can mean mom and dad. Some are adopted. To others, maybe perhaps Spiritual moms and dads come. Those, our natural moms and dads weren't there for us, but the Lord was gracious and those who were like a mom and dad to us and helped us grow up in the world. It can maybe be fond memories of your childhood. Maybe family get-togethers, picnics. Maybe. But I think for most of us too often, it means pain when we think of our earthly families. A lot of pain, a lot of wounds, a lot of brokenness. And not just with us, but a lot of brokenness in our relationships with each other because we're such broken people. Why I said earlier, I use brokenness, but I have two different ways of meaning it. This time I mean we're just broken people to keep breaking people. And so, what makes a family unique? Think about that. What makes our earthly family, any family unique. What makes it unique is it's a like seed. Whatever you're born into. We're that, your family, your natural family, whatever you're born, you're of like seed. Even if you're adopted and you never know your real mom and dad, for whatever the reasons, you're still of that seed. That you were your original parents. You can't remove that. That's what makes a family unique. So when we are born, we become that seed. And as we grow up, we produce the fruit of that seed. It can be good, it can be bad. Most of the times it's a combination of both for everybody. Our earthly families and what we experience growing up all affect our relationship with the Lord on the deepest level. And even though at our new birth, even though our new birth, I'm going to say that, his seed, thank God for Jesus' 
DNA. His seed is planted within our spirit man. So good seed is put in us now. Whatever our families seed, we now have good seed in us. But it's a process for that seed to grow and to produce good fruit. It's just a seed when we're, when we're saved. And I'm going to just share, if it helps, a little bit of an analogy. You know, the, the parable that Yeshua was talking about, the seeds, the Lord is talking about the Word of God, and he's talking about how much we embrace truth. That determines how good of the soil is and how much fruit the seed will produce, how much we embrace truth. And so an analogy can give or help us. You know, we've got a weed and a flower. And if the weed, you know, the Word of God in our lives, when we look at the Word of God, the Word of God is coming along. And it's trying to uproot things in our life. It's trying to uproot whatever is hindering us, what's ever stopping us from going on to be all that he created us to be. He saw our end and he said it was good. He saw our end and he said, you're to be my bride. You're to be my sons and daughters, sons of God. I want you next to me on my throne. But we have things that need to be uprooted out of us. And so the word of God comes along and attempts to uproot a decision that we made that's causing us to walk in the wrong path. The decision was simply a seed that was planted in our life by us or by somebody else. So the Word of God comes and it reveals. It shines a light upon the problems, the downfalls, the hindrances, the bondages that are in our lives, and then enabling us to cry out to want to be out of this bondage. So, and most Christians, they, most Christians realize we've got issues. We're pretty messed up people. We're not walking in the glory yet, but it's coming. Most cry out to the Lord, and they know they've got these issues, and they, we do things that we know we hate doing. Please, there's an, in this conversation, we're, we're very transparent. We're real here. There's no shame and no condemnation. This is just real. We do things that we know we hate doing, and we're ashamed of it. And we don't know how to overcome it. But a lot of times Christians cry out, and when they pray, Lord, remove this from me. Rip it out of my life. I don't want it anymore. Well, that's true, and that's a sincere prayer. But he doesn't work that way. He doesn't just rip everything out. Because it's like that weed. Good seed and bad seed now. So think of the beautiful flower. And if a weed and a flower grow up together, if the weed is wrapped around the flower, it's suffocating that flower and it gets bent over. It gets bent over. So if the Lord comes in and just tries to rip out that weed, he rips out everything. And our lives are such a mess, and they're so intertwined and intertangled that it has, he's the master of surgery. He knows the steps we need to take. He allows our circumstances to come in when we're ready to deal with it, and he starts removing by allowing situations to come into our lives. It's, a, it's exposing these things in our life, the hindrances. Often it is sin, but often it's just emotional challenges. It's hurts, it's pains, it's things that happen to us as a child. We never asked that have happened to us. And only he can help us overcome that. And he knows the time. But our lives are so interwoven and they're wrapped around, tied to other aspects of our lives. So God begins to work things out of our lives. Like a weed that's wrapped around that flower. And if the weed is, and if the weed is not removed, if that weed is not removed, and I'll say that again, if that weed is not removed, it causes that flower to bend over. And it loses its beauty. And it takes on the shape of the weed. And so likewise, that's what our sin and our bondages are doing in our lives that the enemy wants us to stay in. They have wrapped themselves around so many aspects of our lives and bent us toward a particular thing that's destroying us even after we're born again. I'm talking to his church, to believers, not the unsaved. This is what's going on in the body. And God in his sovereignty, supernaturally, yes, when we're saved, he breaks the power of the weed. When we get the new idea, he breaks that. We're going to talk about this in detail. And he cuts it from its root and he releases it 
but because of the flesh, our unrenewed mind, which is our soul. We're still bent over by the causes of life. So though we have Christ within us, that seed, we're like that weed bent over and we can't see Jesus because of the effects of our life. So God has a plan. He knows all this. So God deposits his word on the, uh, the inside of us, and as we embrace it, little by little, it begins to take the bend out of our lives. And we start to stand up straight again. But it's a process, and it doesn't happen overnight. And it's precept upon precept, line upon line. But we also have to know every time we step away from truth, we're not doing truth. We're not embracing truth. We're not in the Word. We're not in the prayer life. We're out in the world. We, we think compromise is okay. Every time we step away, every time, every time we step away from truth, it allows that weed to bend us over again, stopping us from being the beauty that we were created to be. So, as a believer, to embrace truth means to die to self. It means to embrace the power of the cross. To embrace the cross means resurrection power. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Because that's the same power that raised Yeshua from the dead. It'll flow through us, and that's what transforms us. What a promise. What a hope. It's worth dying for. But we need to understand the process. We need to understand what he's after. We need people to help us know what the Word of God is showing us and that he has a plan in there for us. And not just, we don't need, the last thing we need in the church these days is telling you everything's well. And it's all covered by grace because we've got a lot of messed up people that are addicted and bondages, oppression, infirmities, and there's no transformation in the church. What we need is to hear about the, the gospel that Yeshua preached and Paul preached. Then we'll be restored, living the crucified life. Because when we die, Lord, you're dead. What does John 12, 24 say? That unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, what does it do? It produces fruit. I encourage you to remember that verse. John 12, 24. 1 Corinthians, Paul speaks in 15, 36. He says, foolish man, every time you plant a seed, you sow something that does not come to life unless what? It dies first. We have to know there's a key to us producing fruit, and it's directly related to our death. Praise the Lord, I'm here to share the good news. <laughs> Um, so like a seed, unless it falls to the ground and dies, it can't produce fruit. So it is for us. Why well, Yeshua gave that, that scripture. So it is for us. So we must die first. It's not the other way around. Because what does the word say? Unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, then it'll produce fruit. Church's got it backwards in some ways. Well, they're not even dying. But they think they're producing all this fruit, but it's out of their flesh. It's not out of the perfect will of God. A lot of good works. But many are going to stand on that day and, and hear a lot of the words that were spoken in Matthew 7, I believe it's 21 through 23, depart from me. I know you not. You didn't do my will. But Lord, Lord, I prophesied in your name. I healed the sick. I cast out this. You didn't do my will. Serious. That if we're not dying, we're going to miss the will of God because we're going to be too busy building our own kingdom. So, we must die first to produce good fruit if we are to fulfill our call and our destiny. We must embrace truth. And not just hear truth, but do it that James 1 speaks about in, in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. It says, hear the word and do the word. 
You know, don't be like that man that looks at themselves in the mirror and walk away. That's what most do, if they even look at the Word, even if they listen to the Word. But we've got to be doers of the Word. And you'll hear me say often, we don't even just have to embrace truth. I say you've got to love truth more than you love your own life. More than the breath that you come out, because it is what is going to transform us. What does it say? The truth is what sets us free. we really got to let the Word of God sink into us. His Word is truth. I have conversations with people. I can't go by my circumstances. I can't go by what my emotions say. I have to go by what the Word of God says. Now to him who is able to prevent me from stumbling and present me blameless before the presence of this Lord, he's able to do it. That's what his Word says, right? Jude one twenty four. That's truth. All my circumstances that tell me I'm going to stumble and he, I can't be presented blameless, that's a lie, if I want to believe it. So it's why we have to be in the Word. It's what sets us free. And we have to become the Word, do the Word. So, at our new birth, when we're saved, we need to know that literally a death takes place. We have the old man on the inside that dies. And at that time, we were given his seed where the new man on the inside is created, our spirit man. That's just a baby. It's just a little baby. But the old man on the inside dies. But we've got our new spirit man. But we have a problem here. We still have our old man on the outside that needs to die and be crucified. That didn't go away at our new birth. New man on the inside, old man on dead. A literally death took place. And we see, you know, Paul speaks about that, that in Colossians 3, 5. He talks about kill your flesh, kill your evil impulses. Galatians 5, 19 through, I think it's 20 or 21 through those verses, talks about the works of the flesh. Envy, selfishness, drunkenness. You know, I encourage you, look at those scriptures. Go through them all. Have you passed them all? That should be, are you dead to self yet? But we've got a lot of flesh that needs to die. And so, this is where we get hung up on. But before I get too far on that and jump ahead, we can look at some scriptures, and I'm not going to take the time because we usually have a lot to share. And I always try to be sensitive on time, so Lord help me. But Paul, we can look at a few scriptures. You can write them down. You can look them up later. I would encourage you to, but Romans, specifically chapter 6, verses 3 through 6. And I'm just going to read them for us. And it says, Are you ignorant of the fact that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so... We also should walk in newness of life. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, in the likeness of his, likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with, with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So we can see just in those few scriptures, again, Romans 6, chapter 6, verses 3 through 6, we all, when we became a believer in the Lord Jesus, there's many baptisms a believer should be going through. And this is one. We're all baptized into his death. That's what the word teaches us. That's where that death took place on the inside of our old man. We also say that in verse 4, it says that we're buried in his baptism into death like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Notice there's a condition on there. It says we should also. It doesn't say it's not automatic. That we should all be walking in the same resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead. That's the newness of life that Paul's talking about. And it says in verse 5, again, another condition. I'm pointing out that it starts out, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. And I'll take planted together and I'll say, if we have been conformed in the likeness of his death, we shall also be, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. 
So we can see there's a, just an ad, there's a process taking place. If we are conformed to his death, we shall also walk in the same resurrection power. You know, Paul's, he talks about this in, in Philippians 3, I think it's verses 10 through 11. Paul's number one priority and desire, it says in there, was to know Christ. To know Christ. And, and, and he said that was to know Christ and to know the power of his resurrection and to share in his sufferings transformed to his death. So there's a transformation that takes place when we begin to die. Paul knew that. He lived the crucified life. It makes me really sad when I hear some of the prosperity messages and ministries out there that like to take the Gospels and the word that Paul speaks and talk about all this grace, 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 and I'm like he's talking about dying. You know, it's not there just to give you the license to go out and do whatever you want. And we take, we don't present the whole scripture. We cut scriptures apart. And I can never understand that. I just had a conversation not too long ago, and I said, this is what Paul, Paul spoke about. So, his number one priority was to know Christ. Just to know him. Because he knew to know Christ meant to die, and to die meant to walk in the resurrection of power. He tasted and seen the heavenly things of the Lord. And so, in this hour, like never before, like never before, I believe personally, the Lord Yeshua is knocking on the doors of our hearts. Revelation 3.20, he's knocking. He's knocking on the heart of his church. And he's calling us all back into that place of intimate fellowship, back to relationship. He's calling us out of that places of, of sin, out of bondage that's separating us from him, out of the hindrances, and it's not always sin. You know, it's not always. There's real mindsets, that, real emotional healing that needs to take place that's stopping us from going on, that we never did. But he's calling us back to that place. He's just saying, are you willing to let me in? He's knocking. He's knocking. Are we going to open it? He wants his family back. He wants us restored. He wants us whole. He wants us healthy. He wants to rule and reign with each and every one of us. You know, so, so how do we get there? How do we get to let him in? How do we get to that place where we can open that door and let him in? You know, how do we get there when most of us, as I said earlier, we're broken people who keep breaking people. We should be healing people. But the sad truth is, is church is going out, and it's just sad. We're breaking people. We're so selfish, so prideful, so I'm not even talking about it. We're so unkind to one another. Just how unkind we are. It's really hit me in the past month or so. And we have a lot of wounds, and on top of that, we already have them, so we're all bringing all our wounds, all our messes into the body. You know, we have a lot of wounds, we have a lot of flaws. We have a lot of emotional and physical bondages to overcome. So how do we do that? Has anyone ever told you how to do that? Have you ever felt you've succeeded in doing that? I think most would say no. We could, I, I know for the renewal of the mind, it took me years. I would read Paul. You know, Paul gives us a key. You know, he speaks of that in Romans 12, 1 through 3, and Ephesians 4, 23. He says, in Romans 12, 1 through 3, he says, first of all, he says, dedicate your bodies as a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed to the ways of the world. But what? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that what? You can know the perfect will of God. So we can see, first thing he said, present your, dedicate your bodies as a living sacrifice. First thing is deny yourself. Die is what he's saying. If you're willing to die, that means you're not going to be conformed to this world. And if you're not going to be conformed to this world, it means you're going to start to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And then when that starts happening, that's when you begin to hear the word of God clearly. That's when you know the perfect will of God. That's what the scripture tells us. 
Ephesians 4.23 says, be constantly renewed in the spirit of the mind. So I've read these for years. I didn't know what they, I really didn't know how to do that. And it wasn't even until probably the past few years, the Lord really helped me, gave me revelation on that. And I'm going to share that today. And, and he even gave me more as I was preparing for this message. So praise the Lord. I thought, wow, Lord, look at that. I could summarize this whole message. It'll probably take us two hours in one sentence, but that wouldn't, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be too fun. <laughs> Well, Lord, back. Um, but praise the Lord. So why did Paul say these in Romans 12, 1 through 3? I would be a good teacher if I didn't take you through the exercises, right? Give you something to think about. Just give you the, the snapshot. But the good news is there will be an acceleration that will take place because of that. So it won't take you 10 years, 15 oh, years to figure it out. You can get it all today in, two, in an hour and a half, hopefully. So, um, so why did Paul say this? He's, he said it because you've heard me often say, if you've heard or if you've listened to the messages, that our, our soul, our new birth, we have our spirit man. That's new. But our soul is not saved. James 1, 21 tells us that. It says, get rid of all wickedness with a humble spirit so that you can receive the, the power of the word to what? Save your soul. Our soul is a key here. You know, too many people think we're just spirit and flesh, but we've got this third component that's messing us up. That's all. And so he said this because he knew our soul is not automatically saved in our new birth, and it needs restored. You know, it's our flesh that wars against our spirit, and it wars constantly because in Ephesians 4.23, at least the amplified version, and that's why I say that, and I believe this is true, he said it because it's, it constantly needs renewed. Mm. Our, our mind constantly needs renewed. Every decision we make, every day, we need to, we're either embracing truth or compromise. Every time we embrace truth, we take a step closer to being renewed, transformed. Every time we step in compromise, we go back or stay stagnant. So Paul said that, be constantly renewed in the spirit of the mind. This is where we stumble over and over and over again in our walk as a believer. We do the very things we hate doing because our mind is what needs renewed. And Galatians 5.17 tells us, he says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Paul knew this intimately. He walked this out. So, I hope by the time I'm done today, we'll have a better picture of what's going on. But we need to know that it's the old man on the outside, our flesh, for lack of a better word, our body suit, yeah. you know, that houses our spirit and our soul. You know, we're a spirit being that has a soul. That's how we were created. And so, it's the old man on the outside, our flesh, that's warring against the new man, our spirit man, on the inside. And it's a constant battle for most who are not in this process of dying. And when you're dying, it's a battle. Trust me, it's not easy and it's, it's hard. But at least you understand what's going on. And there's hope in that. And it's why there's so little transformation taking place. Why so, many, so few people in the body of Christ are being set free from sin, from bondages, from addictions from oppression, depression. The list can go on and on and on. It's, it is the main reason. We're not dying. We're not getting renewed. Our soul is not getting saved. We've got our flesh and our spirit constantly warring against each other. This is the battle that every believer goes through. We need to know that. We're not alone. Every believer faces this internal struggle. And it's hard if you don't know how to navigate through that as you walk through your life circumstances. You can end up pretty hopeless. And God doesn't want us to be without hope. He's the God of hope, God of peace. So how do we overcome? We have to understand what's taking place on the inside. What I call the interrelational struggle that is going on with our spirit, our soul, and our body, or flesh. I'm going to use body and flesh interchangeably, if that's okay. If one 
And, and soul and mind interchangeably too, because our soul is our mind. And so, and how it's our soul or our mind that needs renewed. So again, we've got our spirit man, we've got our soul, and when we're first, it's the unrenewed mind. That's our emotions. Then we've got our body, our flesh. And our flesh must be crucified. That's the part that we have. We're the ones in charge of that part. We have to make the choice to crucify. God isn't just going to remove it from us like that. He isn't going to just yank it out of us. We have to decide. We have to let him, then he'll do the work in us. And so our soul is our mind. It's where we make it make decisions. You've heard me say before, it's like a computer hard drive. It stores all our data. Before we were ever even born, it's got all our, our DNA in there, all our genealogy, all our generational iniquities. It's got all the things that were passed on to us that we never even, we most don't even know about. How can we? How can we? It, it, a lot of people, it's impossible. So it's also... It's the seed of our emotions. It's our intellect. It's where we're making our decisions from. We need to be aware of that. It's our soul is where we make our decisions from. It's where our wounds, our old wounds are stored. It's where we store offenses. It's where we store unforgivenesses for whatever the reason that have never been healed. That have never been healed. So we need to start recognizing, if you're not, that when we... When we face adversity in life, we walk through life. We all walk through it every day. We never know what we're going to get when we pick up a phone call or walk through a door. True? You think it might be one thing, and next thing something blows up in your face, right? I don't know. It must just be me, Lord. We must just stir it up. <laughs> anyway, so, um, but it's true. We, we really don't know. But, the, but no, the Lord is allowing that on purpose. It isn't all the enemy. We need to quit blaming the enemy. Too often we blame the enemy, and if we really want to, most often we're our worst enemy. But God is more times than not in it. I'm not saying there's real times where the enemy, yeah, he's, he comes along. The Lord allows the enemy to stir up. The Lord's allowing it for a reason, because he wants to redeem. He wants to save your soul. He wants to save your soul. He wants you to come on and be all that he called you to be. So when we face that adversity, what happens? Because remember, our soul is like a computer hard drive. It's storing our memory, our, our emotions, our wounds. So all of a sudden, we, we run into someone. We're, we're just trying to be nice. They blow up in our face. You know, whatever the reasons might be. It starts to trigger those wounds on, a very, on an unconscious level. It's, please know this. It's on an unconscious level. Unless you're walking a crucified life, you'll begin to recognize it. But... It triggers those wounds and those ungodly desires that are in our soul, and it sends a message to our body, our flesh, telling it to react in a way that does not align with the Word of God. So if our flesh listens, then that's why we are constantly at war with our spirit man, and our soul is in control when our spirit man is supposed to be in control. So we have these two voices Telling us, telling our flesh what to do. I, I did think of having a diagram because it would have helped. <laughs> I could get three bodies up here. <laughs> and, but we need to realize we have two voices that tell our, our flesh what to do. The old man on the outside. We're either listening to our spirit man or we're listening to our soul. And now if your mind isn't getting renewed, you can be sure you're listening to your soul and not your spirit man. That's the key need to be aware of that. And so, if our mind and soul is not renewed, then what it does is it grabs a hold of that weak part of our flesh, where we're wounded, where we're tempted, where we're hurt, where there's old wounds, whatever it might be, and we end up doing the very things we hate. Because our soul is dictating to our flesh what to do. But if the two voices, meaning our spirit and our soul, join together, that's the healthy relationship. And when we start to speak from our spirit man and we tell our, our flesh what to do, meaning, no, I, you literally say, you recognize the battle, you recognize the behavior, you've been around this mountain more than 40 times, and it's not working, and you say, no, I'm not doing it that way anymore. I'm choosing to make a decision based on what aligns with the Word of God. 
That's when you're dying to self. That's when you start to become like a seed that goes into the ground. That's when you can begin to produce good fruit. But equally important is that's when your mind starts to get renewed. And trust me, it's hard. Because your flesh is screaming, No, I want to do it the way I've been doing it my whole life. I'm happy where I'm at. This is comfortable. What you're asking me to do, I hate. But what our spirit, that's why our spirit and our flesh conflict. So, that's what's called crucifying the flesh. Too often we hear the word, and I know you hear me say it often, but this is what this message is about, to really break this down. That's what crucifying the flesh means. Is we let our spirit man, because we need to know we've got a spirit man, we've got our soul, and then our flesh. And right now, our flesh is dictating to us with our soul. It should be the other way around where our spirit man is in the front, controlling us, telling us what to do. If we're walking, as Paul says, in the spirit. We'll get into that. Jumping ahead. So we're either walking after the flesh or after the spirit. You know, Paul speaks about that. And that's what that means. And if our spirit man is to ever grow, if we're ever to get past stage one that we talked about and looked at last month in the, the justification stage of our coming into full salvation, if we're ever to go on to stage two, which is the purification process, meaning that's where our spirit man will start to grow. When we die and purify, when we die and let the sanctifier come in, when we die, let him cleanse us. When we die, we keep producing more fruit. We keep, we keep growing. Our spirit man starts to grow when we start to mature into the deeper things of God. We start to lose the desires of this world. They're no longer tempting to you anymore. They no longer can comfort your flesh. It's really encouraging in that process, but it, it takes a while to get there. And trust me, Satan will come along to anyone who's trying to do this, and it's new to them, and he will try to beat them up and discourage them from doing it because he knows it's a key to transformation so we like. He knows it's a key to the bride coming forth to sit next to the bride for a king. He knows it's a key to his dismiss, that when he can't keep us in bondage anymore. So, if our spirit man is, is to grow mature and we are to fulfill our destiny, we have to crucify our flesh. It's a must. It's a requirement. It's like going to college or high school or whatever that, that program is. You have certain requ required classes you have to take. If you're not willing to crucify your flesh, your spirit man will stay stagnant. You will stay that baby believer. And so we have to learn to say no every time our soul acts out, causing our flesh to want to react, not according to the word. That's why I said the word of God is alive and living. Again, I'll say it's easier said than done. This is the battle. This is the overcoming. This is the qualifying to be the overcomer. This is what's going to help prepare us to be ready for our wedding day and be dressed in the right garment. This is the process. And so most believers, though, are walking after the flesh. Their soul and their flesh are joined together, and they're warring against the spirit man. Most decisions they make are from their soul, from an unrenewed mind. Therefore, they are not in the will of God, because that's what Romans 12, 1 for he says that it's by the transformation of the renewal of your mind that you know the will of God. So if we're making decisions off our soul, we're not renewed. We're not, we're not being transformed. And God's after transforming us, trust us, and it's absolutely possible. It's exciting. And so Romans 8 through 6 says, and I just encourage people to go and look at that. Sometimes they have a hard time with these words, and I just have to go by what the Word of God tells us. But he says that in verse 6 in Romans chapter 8, that a carnal mind is death. The mind of the flesh. Death. He further says in verse 7 that a carnal mind is an enemy against God. Further says in verse 8, that a carnal mind, we cannot please him. That's serious. 
We need to know every time we're walking after the flesh. Every time we're walking after the flesh, we're an enemy to God. That's what his word tells us. Every time we're walking in the spirit, it pleases him. And know that walking in the spirit doesn't mean everything's great all of a sudden. It doesn't mean your life's perfect. It doesn't mean you've been perfected in love yet. No, we're all in the process of being perfected. I often say, and you'll hear me, I'm perfectly flawed and in the process of being perfected. Hallelujah, but I'm willing to go on. Willing to go on. And so what it means is your heart, you're making those choices. And if you haven't listened to the message, I encourage you to go back and listen to consecration again and sanctification because it's those choices that we're making. And remember, behind every righteous choice is the power of God to perform it. It isn't a feeling. It isn't a thought. It isn't an emotion. That's when we're walking in the Spirit. We're making a choice. doesn't mean your whole life has been restored yet. doesn't mean everything's good. It doesn't mean everybody likes you. Because actually, most people are going to think you're crazy when you start living this life. And actually, in church. Because it goes against our flesh. It goes against our comforts. We want things easy. We want fast food. We want a microwave. We want God to yank it out. We want him to do it all. And he's saying, no, I created you to co-partner because I want you back into an intimate love relationship with me. And I refuse to have a relationship without you. Because what is a relationship? It's two ways. So when we walk in the flesh, meaning we're refusing to crucify our flesh, and that's what we're doing, whether it's ignorant we just don't know, I believe most don't know because I don't hear much of this being taught in the church. Most don't know. But that's what we're doing. Regardless of whether we know or not, we're refusing to crucify our flesh. We're refusing to take up our cross in exchange for his will. Not only are we an enemy to God, but Paul speaks about this in 1 Corinthians, believe it's chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. But he says we're acting like babies. You know, I want to give you milk. I want to give you meat, but all you can handle is milk. You know, you're full of envy, strife, division. You're basically, he says further on, in one, one translation, you're acting like unsaved people. You know, that's it's why our soul needs saved. It's why renewed by being stored and being saved meaning renewed, being restored by truth. Truth is a key to, to the renewal of the mind. Truth is a key to our transformation life. Truth is the key to everything that will set us free and transform us. We don't have to live the lives that we live that are not what God called us to live as a believer. He has, he, he's able to do it in us. He's just looking for our yes. He's just looking for our surrender. Mm -hmm. And so... It's why every believer should be on this journey. Daily, living the crucified life, saying, not my will be done, but his will. What did Paul say? He said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. Paul had a revelation about the crucified life. He said, I die daily, because he knew his death daily meant resurrection power. He was caught up into the heavens many times. He, Lord Jesus face to face. Am I in the body, out of the body? He longed to go be with the Lord, but he knew the Lord needed him on the work to do a work. He walked face to face with his bridegroom king. Every believer is called to live in the supernatural. We need to get serious. We need to realize this is not the abundant life. We need to realize we're too hung up on the temporal. We've been deceived by Satan's plans. We are called to see Jesus face to face. That's what his word says. I believe it's in... Acts chapter 22, verses 14. Now, I could be wrong, so forgive me if I am. I make mistakes. But it says, but this is, I know this is in the Word. And I do think it's that scripture. But he says, I have chosen you that you would know my will, that you would see Jesus Christ, and that you would hear him from his own lips. We're all called to see Jesus. We're all called to walk in the supernatural. This is not the abundant life, and you'll hear me say, yet, for those who are willing. That's why it's worth everything I try to hear. It's why this process of dying is worth everything. It's why Paul said, I die 
daily. He had the revelation. He knew. That's why he said, I just want to know him because trust me, the more you see Jesus, the more that's all you think about. And that's all you want to know. You don't care about self. You don't care about a ministry. You just care about God and just see you again. I just want to know you because every time he gives another revelation of himself to you. And that's transforming us. And that process is to go on. Second Corinthians talks about that. By one degree of glory after another. But if we're not dying, we're not going to see Jesus face to face. His word says, blessed are the pure in heart that will see God. Sanctification. Purification. That's stage two. That's what we, we looked at last, last month. So... When we understand, though, what's happening on the inside, we can recognize the battle within and start to make choices that align with the Word of God. It's not easy. And, and I want to encourage us in this. It's one choice at a time. Every day, everything we go through, but it has to be intentional. You'll hear me say, if you're going to fulfill your destiny, you've got to put away the busyness. You've got to come out of Babylon. You've got to be intentional with your choices you're making. Again, every choice we make, we're either walking in the flesh or we're walking in the spirit. We're either living or bringing spiritual death. And the more we make those choices, the more we become transformed. So it has to be intentional. Just remember last month, our consecration again. Our consecration is making choices to be separated to the Lord. We can also, consecration means just we're separating ourselves to something. The Lord says, be holy as I am holy. So when we're making choices, we're making choices to be set apart for his purposes. Then he comes in and sanctifies us. We can also consecrate ourselves to this world. Because what we behold is what we, we become. If you want to keep, it may not necessarily be a sin if it's, you know, not full of profanity and sexual sin, but if you want to just watch a bunch of, you know, home and garden shows like I used to do. It's not necessarily sin, but I'm not getting anything out of it. It's, it's killing my soul. That would be a choice. I choose not to do that anymore, Lord. And I shared that in one of the messages. I don't know if it was last month or the month before. But I made a choice after 40 days past. I, I quit watching all TV. I never went back to TV again. It's not because I'm so great. I just... I decided I was going to use that time in the evening and spend it with the Lord. And after that 40-day fast, I went back, and I was so happy. I thought, oh, I can finally eat my favorite food. I'm going to watch Home and Garden Show. My husband had just died. So I, it was after that. We used to do that in the evening together. And I was really looking forward to sitting down and, and watching that show. And I did. I had my dinner. I turned it on, and I was just... I, every night, I went and I worshipped the Lord. And I was in, this is my process. I was already walking a consecrated life. I just chose now, okay, Lord, I, I, I'm going to spend that time with you instead. That's a choice of consecration. It isn't necessarily sin, but it's my choice. He didn't beat me over the head. He didn't force me. I willingly said, I'm coming into a relationship with you. I didn't know what, I was, I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I can tell you things happened to me during that time. That wouldn't have happened, and I was really blessed. But the biggest thing that happened, this is a, an example of transformation taking place. I choose to do away with the world, not necessarily bad, busyness, you know, I, it, it's just polluting my mind, polluting my soul. No, no eternal purpose benefit to it whatsoever, other than death to me and stopping me from going on. And so when I was done, I sat there, I, I did, I watched that show. I said, I need you more than I need that show. Lord. I, ne I, got, I never watch TV again. It's been years. But, that, but you don't even know the transformation is taking place. I want to encourage you in that. 40 days I went through that. I didn't think something. I wasn't hit like with lightning bolts and God said, oh, guess what? No, I'm just making a choice. Go to my room, get on my knees, and wash the floor. And, you know, that time could be, you know, it extended. It could be hours sometimes. You know, but it didn't start out that way, but it was just a choice I made. And in that, my soul, that area that I was giving over to this world, sanctifier came, purified me without me even feeling it in some way. And then when I got in touch with the world again, my spirit had been cleansed out of it. It was like you vomited it out. That's why I mean. you lose the desire. You don't want it anymore. But we have, 
be willing to make those choices. And it's not about legalistic, and it's not about works. It's about wanting, as Paul said, what? To know him. My heart has been, Lord, I just, my prayer has been for years and years and years. I just want to know you. I just want to know you. And I just want to fulfill whatever you've called me to do. And you decide what that is. I don't ask. You know, so remember that. Remember that process of consecration sanctification because it's when we consecrate areas of our lives again. That's when the resurrection power comes in. And in my case, sometimes you feel it. Sometimes people get delivered and healed in meetings, right? Right, praise the Lord. Sometimes it can be instantaneously. The Lord knows what we need, and he knows what we're called to, and he knows our wounds, and he knows what accelerations we need. So I will never limit God. You know, he can do what he wants, but usually it's a process because he's looking for us to agree with him. He's looking for us to die. He's proving our heart. He's proving, our, just like any relationship, he proves a relationship. You just don't get married. Usually you don't just get married overnight without knowing somebody. You at least build a bond of trust. You at least think anyway. <laughs> it's pretty deceptive. But, um, sorry. Um, sorry, Lord, forgive me. But that's where the transformation takes place. And often we don't realize what's happening. But I want to encourage you, when you make those choices, just because you're not feeling anything, don't think something's not happening. And don't let Satan come in and tell you a bunch of lies and say, oh, you're just wasting your time. And, you know, because now you're making other choices, people are judging you. And, and say, oh, God would never want you to, you know, don't, you know you're being legalistic or, or whatever it may be. You start to become more peculiar. And we are called to be peculiar creatures. You know? So be encouraged in that. And, and also 1 Peter 1, 9 said, you know, one that I often quote is, you know, to receive the end result of our faith, the salvation of our soul. That one verse alone tells us that there's a beginning to faith and there's an end to faith. And the salvation, and it was to receive what? The salvation of our souls. So we can now understand our soul is what re needs renewed, and we now understand salvation isn't just everything's automatically done and complete once we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a process. We can now see that there's an end to our salvation. Mm -hmm. Just as there was a beginning to it, our beginning was getting saved. Thank God for Jesus and the blood and the cross. Hallelujah. Thank God. Thank God for you, Jesus. I love you. But... That wasn't where he wanted us to stop. It was to go on to glory, to go on to having our soul restored, to receive the end result of our faith. That's why he gave us faith, to be the overcomer, to be the bride. It wasn't just to get us out of hell. Dear Jesus, no. Thank God for that. But no. So, but also Peter talks about in that same chapter, verse 22, he says, by your obedience to the truth, through the Holy Spirit, you have purified your soul. So we, again, and you're going to keep hearing me come back. Truth is a key. It says, by your own, and obedience. If you haven't listened to the message on obedience, I encourage you to listen to that too. But by your obedience to the truth, so we can see obedience to truth, to truth, is what allows the Holy Spirit, the sanctifier, to come in. When we obey, when we just obey, when we just say yes, we just obey. We're not doing anything. We're not doing anything. We're just obeying. It's all we can do is our yes. Then the sanctifier comes in and it says what? Purifies your soul. So I'm going to always encourage us that it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Just like that weed we started talking about earlier. You know, we're bent over. Most of us have this weed. We have seeds from our, our families mm -hmm. that we were born with that have crippled us. And there's this beautiful flower that the Lord wants to set free. But it's a process. And he can't just yank everything out because that flower is delicate and it's beautiful. And he isn't going to destroy it. So he's the master builder. And so he'll come, and he allows these circumstances to be woven in our lives. But if we don't understand what's happening, how do we respond correctly, right? Most don't understand what's happening. Most aren't responding. They're reacting in their flesh. we got a lot of angry, upset, bitter, unforgiving people in the church. If we were dying, we'd be abiding in love and everything would be 
be great. And Lord Jesus would have came back a long time ago. It's the truth. And we would die. Die to self. Die to our own kingdoms. Die to our own ambitions. Die to our pride. We got so much pride. So, and this is not a judgment on anybody. Talking from my own personal experience. Years and years and years of walking with the crucified life. Years and years of just being willing to be teachable. Lord, just teach me. Lord, my prayer still to this day. I'm so broken. I'm not going to say you can't break me anymore, but Lord, just break me some more. Because I know that place of brokenness is the best place I can be. That brokenness before him. I know that's where I can be of the best service to him. I know that that's where he can use me and get the maximum use out of me. And that's the cry of my heart. Just use me, Lord, I'm willing. I can't make one single person love you. I can't make them obey you. I can't make them want to know you. All I can offer is you and say, Lord, just use me. That's my cry. All I can do is share. And I try. And I care about every heart. I want everyone to go on to their high and lofty destiny. But at the end of the day, all that we can come to him and offer him is our will, our heart. And so it doesn't happen overnight. And he allows those, he, those what I call our custom design test. He orchestrates those situations. And what do they do? They expose what I call the tears of our, our heart or our soul. They expose the tears in our soul that need uprooted, that we, one bit at a time. He cut the root at our new birth. But it still has us bent over in life. It's still stopping us from going on. We can't see Jesus. We're bent over down. And he says, we'll go. But how can we stand up when we've got so much bondage that we need to be set free from? And so he helps us by orchestrating situations that expose those tears in our heart that need uprooted, by bringing them to the surface. And he does it, notice, he does it when he knows, first of all, when he's ready to do it, because he's God, but equally important, he does it when he knows we're able to handle it his way and walk it out his way. He never gives us more than we can handle. It feels like it, but if you're walking through some tough things today, I want to encourage you. He, he will never give you anything more than you can handle. And he's after transformation in your life. He's after exposing what is harming you and his relationship with you. And ultimately your relationships with others. Because I often say, we got to get this vertical relationship right. Our relationship between our, the Lord and, the, and our King and our Father. And known as the lover of our soul. That intimacy restore that is so lacking in the church. We'll have such a fear of intimacy. Huge. And once we get this research, then we can have right relationships. It's one reason the body's so messed up. We don't know how to relate to one another because we don't know how to relate to the Father and Jesus. We don't know what intimacy is. Again, it goes back to the seed that we were born with from our natural families for the most part. And some of it is we just choose not to walk. Most people, I don't think, if they aren't living the crucified life, they're not dying to self. And, if, and I think it's because most haven't, they don't realize the teachings are out there. It's what the Word of God teaches us. But if they do, they're just choosing not to do it. If they've heard about living, dying, it's like, no, we want something easy. No, oh, that's too hard. I just want to hear everything's good. I want to surround myself by people who are going to tell my itchy ears what I want to hear. And so it's not bringing transformation. So he does it when he knows we're able to handle it. But again, I encourage you. That if we're going through some tough stuff, it's because he knows you're able to handle it. And not that you can do anything. He'll do it in you. He just now has positioned you to be set free. Hallelujah. Chains and shackles can come off. But it's not easy. Because that flesh is warring against you. That flesh doesn't want to do it. Satan wants to keep you in bondage. So he wants to keep your soul all messed up, dictating your flesh what to do. And that's where you have to go, okay, I'm saying that. I know that's wrong, and I know what the Word of God says. And then you let the power, the resurrection power of the Word come in. And you have to just keep me, and you'll fall. You'll make the mistake. Satan will come along, and he'll say, you fool, you idiot. Told you you never could do it. Told you you're not going to amount to anything. I told you you're going to fail. Don't listen to the lies. Recognize the battle. Recognize that we got real demons sitting on our shoulders whispering to all those things. 
That didn't come from you and that didn't come from God. Those lies, those thoughts only come from one place and from the pit of hell. Recognize them. Recognize them. And so, to crucify our flesh is to have our soul restored. And again, I'll say, also healed in an area that's hurting us. For that to take place, we need to lose pride. We need to lose our flesh. And I'm not talking about going on a diet. But we need to lose pride. And we won't lose pride until we're willing to die. Again, to our emotions. And I don't mean we become robots and emotionless people, but I mean that we don't just react to everything around us. We start to, what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility. Last one, self-control. I always encourage everyone, become the fruit of the Spirit. That's my litmus test. When I go through some difficult times, and, and you yeah, know, Lord, how did I do? I, you know, it's just to judge yourself. Don't judge others, but judge yourself. I look at the fruit of the Spirit when I go through something. Was I love? Was I joy? Was I peace? Was I patience? Was I kindness? Was I goodness? Was I faithfulness? Was I humility? Was I self-control? Often you hear me say, sometimes I get all night wrong. I just blow it. Thank God he's able to prevent me from stumbling. Yeah. And that's where the enemy, when you, you do, we fail. But you know what? Our failures are not, what we think are our failures are not necessarily failures by God. He's wanting us to overcome. So if we don't know what it's like to not make it the first time or the second time or the 20th time or even the 100th time, we're never going to become the overcomer. If we don't have something to overcome, how can we be the overcomer? So be encouraged in that, but the enemy will want to come in those moments and say, see, I told you. You're just stupid. You can't do it. Don't listen to that lies. They're from the pit of hell. That's easier said than done, I know. Much, and especially when it seems like those who are pursuing the deeper things of God, those that I know, we seem to be like these little isolated islands. We don't have a lot of support. We don't have people in the body encouraging us in this place. That day is going to change. Praise God. This true church is coming. It will be united in truth, purity, holiness, the fear of the Lord. It will stand against the false church that's allowing the compromise that's destroying our lives. So... It's why there's so little growth and maturity in Christians that you heard me say earlier. Again, this is, this is a key. Our mind is not being renewed. Our souls are not being renewed. This is a key to transformation. And it's, and it's why we're stuck as baby believers. We're just like Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. You know, we're like babes. We're fighting. We're in division. We're in strife. We're bitter. Babes. And so it's why so many are in bondage, why so many addictions, why there's so much profanity and hopeless. How much profanity is there in the church, for goodness sakes? How many? I mean, people that think, say that if we would take the Lord's name in vain, we blaspheme in his name alone. But just so many things. And I know believers are, you know, addictions of every kind. And it isn't a judgment. The Lord wants to set us free from all of that. You know, there's also just the minds, the emotions that we battle. You know, a lot of hopelessness, a lot of depression in the church and his people. You know, this is not the transformation life that he called us to live. But if we're not dying, remember the seed. If we're not dying, we have to die in order to produce fruit. But we have to know what we're, we're expected to die to. Our will is basically what it comes down to. Are we willing to die to our will? Are we willing to exchange our will for his will? So, and if we, it, it's why there's very little spoken in the church about this. 
But Matthew 16, 24 says, Yeshua says himself, the Lord says, that if you want to be my disciple, it says what? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The first thing he says, it requires a response by us. Deny yourself. What does that mean? Crucify your will. Are you willing to deny your will and what? Take up the cross, my will, and follow me. That's not easy. But that's what his word teaches us. That's what Yeshua taught, the crucified life. He was our example. So why would he expect us not to walk the exact same life he did? It further says in verse 25 in Matthew chapter 16, it says, Whoever is bent on saving his life shall lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. So again, I'll say, whoever is bent on saving his life shall lose it. Meaning, if we're going to hold on to the temporal, it's going to cost us our soul. But if we're willing to lose our life, we're going to find. If we're willing to lose our will, we're going to find life. So we can see a death is place, taking place one way or another. We're going to die one way or another. Yeah. We might as well let our flesh die and embrace spiritual life than let our soul die and experience spiritual death. Maybe. So, in closing, and I am, I brought up, I have it. I don't know how many of you, has anybody ever read the book, I believe, in Visions by Kenneth Hagin? I encourage you to get that book. It's an old book, if you haven't. I've, um, Kenneth Hagin is with the Lord, precious saint. Powerful book. It'll help you in your prayer life. It'll encourage you. It'll help you understand the influences. And it's a simple read. But you can probably find it on Amazon.com under the used books. You know, it won't cost you much. I doubt you'll find it in any of the bookstores. But in that, he shares, you know, in that, he shared like eight visions, and the Lord came and taught him personally about many things, about his, the healing ministry he was given. But he, he taught him a lot of different things. And one thing I was about the, the, the different influences and demons and how they interact in our lives. And we need to realize, remember I just said all those thoughts that we hear. Am I right? We, we hear those thoughts. Yeah. We're, we all know, Satan, we all heard those yeah. things. We need to know we have real demons. Honestly, I've said this. If your spiritual eyes were open, you would see them. They're in the yeah. church. The church is full of demons. They're sitting there influencing us. Those demons are the ones that are whispering those thoughts. And they're keeping us in bondage. And because we've weakened the church with compromise and mixture, we don't have too many Elijahs around yet confronting sin, we're a mess. But in this, he was sharing, the Lord was teaching him. And he was sharing, the Lord was showing him about a believer because I say, once saved, always saved is a false doctrine that's from the pit of hell. And I'll never apologize for that, but we need to be aware of that. It's what the Word teaches us. And this wasn't the point of the Lord teaching Kenneth Hagin, that wasn't his point for why he allowed him to see what was taking place. But in the in the vision, there was, the whole point is, we're talking about the renewal of the mind. And so he let him see how a thought begins from Satan. And he let him see how it, it goes to the heart and how it manifested and what happened in the person's life. So Kenneth Hagin, he didn't know, it was a pastor and his wife, and he didn't know them personally. He knew of them. And the Lord let him see. And that often happens in the spirit realm. The Lord will just let you look into someone's life. And you see it. And the Lord was showing him this woman who had left her husband. And they were in ministry together. For, I don't know that he gave it for how many years or whatever. But they were in full-time ministry. And she was filled with the spirit. She knew the Lord. She walked with the Lord. And, and what he allowed her to, or what he allowed Kenneth Hagin to see is, so a thought came, and the Lord told her, the Lord told Kenneth Hagin, he said, a thought would come into her mind. Satan would come along, and he would tell her, you're a very beautiful woman. You know, you deserve better than this. 
You, you're, you're called to this. You, you deserve better than this consecration. You can have wealth. You can have more comfort. You're beautiful. And so the Lord said, every time she resisted that thought, and what he saw was this black dot on her mind. That was where the thought began. Remember, it's in our mind, our intellect, our soul, our emotions, where we make our decisions. That's why I'm sharing this from the book. And so every time she resisted it, because what does James say? Resist the devil and he will flee. Every time she did, it left. But it was a demon that looks like a little monkey sitting on her shoulder, whispering into her ear. And so this went on for, it doesn't say for how long, but it went on for a while. And every time that thought would come back, she would resist it. It would flee. Well, then she started to entertain the thought. And when she entertained it now, it no longer stayed just a thought. This is really important for us to know. It now went to her heart. And he saw that black dot now becoming her heart. So once it's a thought, that's one thing. But once it, because what, what is in your, what says what's in your heart, that's what we become. Pulls out of our heart. So she ended up divorcing her husband, left him. Because she got involved, the book says, and, you know, the testimony of the Lord showed, said she had a lot of different men she got involved with. And Kenneth Hagin's really bothered. He's saying, Lord, do you want me to pray for her? The Lord says, no, I don't want you to pray for her. He says, why don't you want me to pray for her? And then he starts to walk through how all that she has to look forward to is the gnashing of, of teeth and outer darkness. Because she, re, she rejected the Lord. And he, and he, and it's a powerful, powerful testimony Kevin Pagan walked in. And he, but the Lord literally gives all the scriptures and shows that. And she, and he says, here's the conditions of how someone can end up in outer darkness. And it takes a lot. A, a new baby believer who said, said no. If they don't know what they're doing, they don't know any better, they're getting pressure. No, but this was a mature believer who was in ministry, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, who worked and operated in the gifts, and now made a choice because of an influence and walked away, and now she has hell to look forward to. And so Kenneth said, well, do you want me? He's like, no. And because the Lord, and the Lord gave every single scripture, and the Lord said, because it's impossible for that person to be restored back to me at that point. Once they make a choice, to reject me because the Lord, she said, and I want to qualify that, she told the Lord, I don't want you anymore. It wasn't just her choices she made. The Lord said she could have had 100 men and asked me to forgive her, I would have forgiven her. But she made the choice and said, I don't want you anymore, Lord. That was the sin unto death that is spoken about. And so, but it, the point I share with this is because it starts with those thoughts. So we need to know that we got real demons influencing us. And that's why I want to encourage us to recognize those thoughts. Resist the devil and he will flee. You know, so in that case, it, it didn't end too good for her, but he was doing that to, to teach Kenneth Hagin different principles. And also he had a huge deliverance ministry and healing. You know, and to recognize different things that were taking place. And there, there's more incredible th things in there, but the whole point is the thought. And if we, if we entertain that thought, and it can be not even that woman's situation, not what kind of being stirred, but if we just entertain thoughts like you're just this worthless nobody person and you're never going to amount to anything, and if you just believe that and it now sinks to your heart, that's what you're going to become. That's the bigger point I'm trying to make here. As long as it stays a thought and you keep resisting it and not let it go into your heart, and trust me, there's redemption, at least in something like that, the Lord can t deal with that. You're not rejecting the Lord in that process. But that's what's happening. If we don't resist those thoughts, they start to go and they say, and Judas I scare is a, an example of that. What does it say? At the right opportunity, the Lord allowed, Satan came and he put what? A thought in his mind. It was a thought that led to his utter destruction. So the battle is in the mind and the soul and the intellect that I think we're all pretty aware of. I think we all know we get pretty beat up in our mind and our emotions as we try to walk this life in this fallen world. But be encouraged in that and be, be aware of that. So 
as I started earlier, I could sum, summarize the renewal of the mind in probably one sentence. And what it really means, looking at all of this, but at least we know the spirit, the soul, the body. We see the interrelational things that are taking place. We know we've got different voices. It, we need to understand all that. But if you want to break it down and just make it really simple, in its simplest form, to have our mind renewed is when our flesh dies, when we're making the choice to die, our mind and our soul is renewed and we experience resurrection power that's transforming us to be like Yeshua. Renewal of the mind will only come about when we're dying. So like that seed that dies, it starts to produce good fruit. So when our flesh dies, our mind begins to remove. It means that death is taking place, crucifying the old man on the inside. And when we die, to, when we die, that's when our transformation comes to our soul. That's when those areas of our soul that we're yielding to start to become more like Jesus. And our spirit man grows. This is living the crucified life and what changes us from one degree of glory to the next. When we surrender our will, his light comes and takes over that area in our soul that was dark, causing us to be more like Yeshua and more God indeed. Every believer should be, um, every believer should be experienced transformation in life every day. Every day. Every believer is called, and not only called, but we're expected to live the crucified life. The Lord expects us to go through this. He didn't promise us a rose garden, but he promises to remove the thorns if we'll let him. You know, that's the beauty of the Lord in so many ways. But, but every day we should be experiencing transformation. Like if we die daily, Paul said, I die daily. Every day, Paul was experiencing transformation life. And if we die daily, then we are like the seed that falls to the ground. And fruit, life will come forth. Life will come forth. The Lord is about life, restoring, redemption. So it's absolutely possible to live a sinless life. If not, it wouldn't be in the Word of God. 1 John 1, 2, 6 says, you know, that we, we ought to conduct our lives on the surface of the Lord did. He set our example. Our Father in heaven, and it's hard for a lot of us on this earth because we didn't have good fathers. But as much as that is, we just need to embrace this truth and ask Him to be the Father that we need Him to be. But our Father in heaven is a good Father. He did not set us up to fail, but the exact opposite. If we are saved, then we have his seed within us. Everything we need to succeed to pass our test have been provided to us through the Holy Spirit. All through the Holy Spirit, all by grace. But And also the really how good he is, all our tests are open book. They're all right here. Every answer we ever need, all open book tests. Um, and with the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, greatest teacher, he... he he, he has given us. So it's up to us. How much, I said, I said, started earlier in some ways, how much do we really want to know him? The relationship takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. So every day we face a multitude of decisions and we face adversity. We encounter people that rub us the wrong way. That's life. In those moments, Try and stop yourself and ask, are we making decisions that align with the, the Word of God? And I would use the fruit of the Spirit. Love, am I being loved? Am I being joy? Am I being peaceful? Or are we doing it the world's way? Are we taking an offense? Are we getting bitter? Are we angry? Are we yelling at somebody? Are we cussing them out? Or, or, or we, we choose to um, be cruel to them and just choose not to talk to them and give them the silent treatment? It was always by our words what's in the heart, and how we choose to be be that way. That's the world's ways of doing it. That's not relationship, but that's what our wounds will cause us to react to. So it's why often I say don't waste your trials and your heartache. Learn to recognize the tears of your hearts that need uprooted. Typically, typically it's going to be through relationships in your life that are going to expose the tears. It's going to be through the people that are in your everyday life that are going to expose the tears. And guess what? The good news is, it's not the person or the situation. It's not the problem. 
Too often we want to blame everybody else for what's going on, but the Lord is just using them as a tool to bring the tears in your heart to the surface so that hopefully you'll recognize and go, okay, this isn't really about them. Maybe they've done bad things or horrible things or not nice things, but really the Lord wants you to get his, your focus back on him. Get your eyes on me. Trust me, you and I got a lot to work out. I'll deal with them in my time and if they want me to, but right now you're the one who's saying yes to me. You're the one who's willing and I'm allowing this because I know you're able to deal with this right now because I'm doing it in you and through you. So if we can learn to recognize that the other person's not the problem, they're just helping expose where we need healed. Thank them! <laughs> <laughs> Go buy them a gift! Get them a gift card! Thank you for making my life miserable! I found Jesus and resurrection life because of it! Hallelujah! You're right. <laughs> He's always right! So, but our trials and our suffering are the main tool that the Lord uses to qualify us to be the, the bride and the overcomers. Remember, these meetings are about preparing the overcomers. The bride has made herself ready for her wedding day. And the only way to the glory is through the cross. It's the only way. It's what Romans 8, 17 tells us. So every time we choose to deny our flesh, not retaliate, harbor ill feelings or bitterness or unforgiveness or whatever that might be, the silent treatment, whatever it is, pride, rebellion, disobedience, whatever it can be, Whenever we choose not to retaliate by the ways, the world's ways of doing things, but we choose to bind in love. We, when we do, we're dying. And we're in the process of our mind being renewed. You need to know that you're in that process. Be encouraged. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't taste good. It'll cost you everything. It hurts your flesh. It's hard on the flesh. But be encouraged. And just because your life's a mess, but if you're making those choices, you're dying and you're being renewed. But don't give up. Don't stop. If you, if you come in one day and out the other, you've got to be intentional. If I said you've got to be intentional. That's why last week we talked about our consecration. If you're going to be the bride, it's 100% consecration. There is no gray ground. It's either black or white. We're either for God or we're against God. And so... Don't get discouraged in those places. And it's easy to get very discouraged. I understand. I really understand that intimately. So, but when we are, we're becoming that living sacrifice that Paul talked about. In Romans 12, 1 through 3, but the first verse he says, dedicate your bodies as a living sacrifice. You know, we're called to be a living sacrifice. You know, every time we do, every time we die to this flesh, resurrection power is coming. Remember my example of the 40-day fast? I didn't feel anything, but something was taking place in me. I was making a choice. That's all I was doing. I was just making a choice. And every time we do that, then we're transferring, and it's enabling us to overcome not just always sin, but it enables us to overcome the hindrances, the stumbling blocks that have stopped us from going on, the things that we feel like we have failed over and over again, and we just feel like we just give up, and this, we just accept that this must be my reality, and I'm just stuck with this. No, you're not stuck with it. That's not his plan for anybody. That's not what the Bible teaches us. And so, but remember, it's line upon line. Precept upon precept. So it's a little here and a little there. Just That's why it's a, the, the good, the seed that fell on the good, good soil and look, that we looked at, it said it brought forth fruit with what? In, with patience. Mm -hmm. With patience. So remember, to bring forth good fruit in this dying process, it's going to take a lot of patience. A lot of patience. And so there's a lot of good intentions in the church. People doing what seems good in right, their own minds. But things God never asked any of them to do. And why? It's because most are not embracing truth. They're not embracing the power of the cross. They're not answering the call to die, living the crucified life. Instead, they live a life of compromise. And they're not willing to die to their own ambitions, their own desires, their own dreams, and their own goals. That we see the Lord spoke about in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. They want to do it their way. 
could look good. But if the Lord isn't asking you to do something, I encourage you today, don't do it. It's worthless to him. And it's, it's not bringing you eternal life. And he's after the eternal. We're called to live in the eternal. So at our new birth, the Father put, we need to know this too, not only in that seed that was put in us, our new man, but you need to know that at that new birth, our Father, he put a gift inside of us. You know, our, and that gift is our unique purpose in life, was imprinted on our spirit. If we're not willing to become the seed that falls to the ground and dies so something can be brought forth, we'll never fulfill it. We'll never, if we, and if we do not know our purpose or walk, if we do not know our purpose, what we're called to, and we're all called, first and number one priority in life is to be conformed to Christ, to become like Jesus and work for body. Everything else will fall out of that. The ministry the Lord's given to you. If you're called, whatever that might be, church has got it backwards. They're pursuing ministries that God never asked them to do. But our number one priority will always be to become love, to be perfected in love, to be conformed to Christ. The Galatians 4.19 says, until Christ is completely conformed within you. That's our number. Every believer has that call in their life. But after that, but even if you're not willing to go through the dying process, you're not even going to know that about yourself, that God expects that of you. And he expects every believer to go through that. He expects every believer to be conformed to Christ. He said, I sent my son. He died for you. Why? So I can have you by my side. It's possible. That same resurrection power that raised him from the dead flows in you. You don't think that resurrection power isn't, isn't powerful enough to get over all your issues in life? Give me a break. Church, wake up. Come out of your slumber. Give, quit giving us excuses. Same resurrection power that raised him from the dead is flowing in us. And if it can raise him from the dead, it can certainly overcome our addictions, our sin, whatever's going on in our life. So we need a real reality check with that. And if nothing else for yourself, grab hold of it and run. And right off and say, Lord, I'm leaving everybody else behind. I don't care. They don't want to grab hold. I'm running with you. I run wherever you want to go, but I want everything you have for me, Jesus. You decide what that is, and I want it all. And I refuse to settle for anything less. That includes the suffering that he's called me to, as well as, well as the glory. But he gets to decide that I want it all. And the only way that's going to happen if we're willing to go through the cross, die. And in that process, so... Our Father put that gift inside of us. Well, not, but he put a unique purpose. Every one of us has a unique call. We're like snowflakes. Every one of us has a call on our life. And it was imprinted upon our spirit. And if we're not willing to die, like I said, it can't come forth. We'll never know it. But, and if we do not know it, if we don't know what our purpose is in life, and think about this, what I'm about to say. If we do not know our purpose in life, Our walk will be aimless and incomplete. Our walk will be aimless and incomplete. We will never be satisfied. How many are looking, always looking? Or just so discouraged they quit looking? How many are really satisfied with their life in Jesus? And so we will look to the things of this world, the temporal things of this world, to satisfy us. And we were called to live in the eternal. We'll look for something else to try to comfort us, make us feel good, make us feel purposeful. We'll go off and start adventures. We'll start building our own kingdoms. We'll start building name, reputation. Whatever it might be, it might not be, you know? To not embrace the cross is to not embrace our purpose. And to not embrace our purpose, to never be satisfied, I'll say again. And if we don't embrace Yeshua to, be satis to satisfy us, we'll definitely embrace something else. We're either drawn to light or darkness. You can't just stay, you can't just stay neutral. You're either drawn to light or darkness. So we'll, we'll seek something else to satisfy us. And they may satisfy us temporarily, 
the soul, the unrenewed part, part of our soul that's yet to bring us any life, but it'll bring us spiritual death, and we need to know that. We're not spiritual death. And we'll miss, ultimately, our eternal purpose in life. So when we embrace truth, know that when we embrace truth, and what we're talking about today, when we embrace truth and we're dying to self, know that we're making an altar to the Lord. We're making an altar. And we feel that death, don't we? How many know what I'm talking about? How many know when you've mm. not reacted in your emotions? Someone says something really hurtful to you, but you didn't lash out. You said you'd left the room and maybe cried your eyes out or whatever, but you just didn't lash out on that person. Okay, that wasn't wrong. But for me to go and yell at them, that's equally wrong. That's what I'm talking about. You make that choice. If you have to, you remove yourself from the situation. It's better to do that than to lash out. But in that process, you're making an altar to God. You're putting that part in your flesh, and doesn't it burn? Doesn't it hurt when we do it? Yeah. It does. It's painful. It's painful. But the only sacrifice that we can that can be burnt is what's dead. It's the only sacrifice that he that his fire can come and now burn. And so the sanctifier then comes and, and burns up that area in our lives. But the wonderful thing is something new is taking place at the same time. As much as it's painful, and if you hang in there and you keep going through this process, um, the resurrection power is released on the inside of us, and we, and we start to respond to our circumstances differently. They don't go away. Please don't walk away from here today and think, life's, oh, I just need to die and everything's going to be good. Well, it's going to be good for you. But you're going to start responding differently. It doesn't mean your situation, but you're going to overcome them, and you're going to respond differently. And in that process, you're going to keep growing, and guess what? You're going to be now releasing life into those who are keeping you in bondage. The more we become. You don't even realize you're doing that. And so you start to change on the inside. And that's the process, and it will work the fruit of the Spirit in you. And I always encourage you, become the fruit of the Spirit. Make that your goal. If there isn't, you know, memorize the fruit of the Spirit. Memorize those, that verse and get it, get it into you and chew on it. Because that's when we get changed from one degree of glory to the next until Christ is completely conformed within us. So again, if this process is not taking place in our lives, then we're not growing in God. We will throw away the very gift he put in us, our high call, which ultimately is to be the bride. And on that day, there will be great regret and tears over the choices we made and how we wasted the one life he had given us to become love, perfected into his likeness, to become like him and more God indeed. It's absolutely possible. It's a choice. We get to decide every decision. doesn't mean we get it right every day. We make a lot of mistakes. But you do start to change. And, it be, and the more you change, then the easier it becomes at least in recognizing the battles, not falling for the traps. And, and then the more you pass your test, guess what? You let bigger tests come. <laughs> it's true. Putting those when you're able. Because remember, he's after for Christ to be completely formed within us. And he can't just rip it all out and put it in at the same time. And he'll never go against start them. So, if we're to but if we go through the process of dying every day, every decision we make where our spirit and soul are joined together and we are operating from our spirit and telling our flesh what to do, I want to just encourage you. When we're telling our flesh, no more, I'm not doing it that way, you know. I'm not doing what my flesh tells me. I'm going to do what the word of God says. I'm going to do what I know is right to do. When we start making our spirit and our soul are joining up together and dictating to our flesh what to do, um, be encouraged. Because flesh look out, Satan look out, world look out. They're not going to have a chance against you. They're not going to be able to defeat you anymore. That's overcoming. That's the grace he's given us to overcome. Whatever it is, our lives are all different. We all have different things we need to overcome. What I need to overcome is not the same what Christine or someone else may need to overcome. Our, our journeys will be similar because the process is going to be the same. So we can encourage each other in that. That's where we can be a source of encouragement yeah. to one another. But our situations are going to be, look a lot different. So that's also why it's very careful that we don't judge one another. Yeah. That we don't know the heart. 
We don't know the wounds. We don't know what someone has suffered through. We don't know, so we have to be so careful not to judge the hearts. I can say even not to judge the fruit that we see in people's lives, because we just don't know. We just don't know what is going on inside. And we can so easily destroy a soul if we want to come along and judge them based on our worthless ways of doing things. I've seen that happen in the church too. I've seen it happen in my own life. And I could even say I almost, you know, went through some difficult things and I had some things that said that really crippled me. If I weren't walking where I was walking with the Lord, they would have taken me out. Thank God for my God's faithful. Thank God I knew what I knew. I thank God I know what the Word of God teaches. Thank God I recognize the battle, but it was hard. But if you talk about a baby believer who doesn't know these things, and they can get so well, you can easily destroy a life. I don't ever want to do that. It's never my heart or my intention. I can say some really stupid things to people, but it's never to be mean or unkind. It's never trying to tear someone down intentionally. I would never want to do that. The Lord knows that. Have I? Absolutely. But never would be my intention. And I'm a very transparent person. I'm about relationship. I'm very open. I can talk to people. I find most people cannot talk with me. I'm okay to have a conversation and just say, can we talk? What's going on? It's about relationship. We're in different places. We change. We grow. I can agree to disagree. And so if I hurt somebody, I want to go to them and tell them, you know, look, I'm sorry. Or I'm seeing this and maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not wrong, but let's talk about it. But too often, we get hurt in that process. It's not safe to go talk. Sadly. Again, our wounds, our healing that needs to take place. So, careful we don't judge. Careful we don't judge one another. But instead, extend grace to one another. And so, We need to know this is his plan to restore us back to intimate fellowship, bringing us back to that place where we depend upon him completely, because ultimately he wants his family back. And what is a father? Doesn't a father want to spend time with his children? Mm -hmm. A good father? Wants to hear everything's going on in their lives. Wants to bless them. Wants to take care of them. Wants to help them learn the hard lessons. So he, his, this is his plan to restore us back to intimate fellowship, bringing us to where we depend upon him completely. And to depend upon him completely means to die to self. He'll never force us into that place of intimacy. We have to choose to die. If we do, it means we have a lot to overcome that we're talking about. But praise the Lord, because it's only the overcomers who will, who will qualify to rule and reign with him. That's the good news. You know, again, I'm going to say he's a good father and his ways are perfect. He knows what we need. And because so many of us have such broken relationships with our earthly fathers, we don't trust our Father in Heaven to make those decisions for us. We take control, we put up all these walls, and we're actually hurting ourselves and keeping us out of relationship with Him. So that's a process, too, to heal and overcome. And I know my own walk, I went through this, and I, lo I love my Father very dearly to this, to this day now. The Lord did a major work in that. But as growing up as a, into my, my adulthood, I never had a father who was there spiritually, emotionally, physically, or financially for me. And when my husband separated and we got and everything blew up in my life, I now lost my husband in one way. The Lord brought a restoration in that because of my walk in covenant, I believe. But he but at that time, my husband left me and my father hated me. And disinherited me and had to go back to the details that my husband shared with my but so I don't have a husband my husband loved me and my father's disowned me and I remember this was the grace of God and this is how I came into the saving grace of the Lord at age 34 and by his grace only God can do this because I didn't grow up with parents who who hugged me told me they loved me were affectionate to me I grew up with parents they wanted to keep a roof over our head we weren't financially well off by any means, but they at least provided what they could. They weren't abusive in any way, other than maybe emotionally abusive. And I grew up in a very dysfunctional family, so I'll take that that way, but I just mean physically. We weren't beaten and we weren't molested in any way like that that happened to a lot of people. So 
So I didn't have those issues to overcome. But when my whole life just blew up, fell apart, age 34, and my, I lost my father and my, my husband at the same time, regardless, I still had a relationship with my father. Don't get me wrong, I was happy. It was just, you know, just, he needed a lot of healing. And I just remember, somehow, you know, I was, the Lord, I asked him to be my husband and my father. Lord, you've got to be my father and my husband. And he did. He started showing me what that was. And very early on in my walk, I mean, almost instantly, he put something inside of me. It's the grace of God. That's why I shared it. They brought with parents that were very affectionate. But I just knew whatever I was going through, and I didn't, this is when I was learning about the crucified life. I didn't know what I know today, then. I didn't know I was walking out the crucified life. But I made a choice very early on in my marriage when my husband was unfaithful to me, and he left, and my parents were divorced. They lived together. So I didn't grow up with typically divorced parents. So I had two parents that lived under the same roof. I had both parents that were divorced. But my mom was very bitter at my dad, and, my, and vice versa. We grew up in this very uh, toxic environment, to say the least. That would be kind. And so when my husband was unfaithful and everything's blowing up, of course, my mom, they're hurt. They, they hate to see this happen to their kids. My mom's just like, you, you, you need to divorce them. You need to do this. And every time I do, I just came into the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for my sister-in-law breaking me on the phone. And all I knew, and I can't explain it, because I don't have any explanation but the grace of God in my life. All I knew is that I was making a different choice than what my mom had made. And it came down to us butting heads. And I didn't maybe act the best way. I don't know. Um, but she was in the house and telling me, you need to divorce him and you need to do this. I just knew that I had a covenant with the Lord. Whether my husband chose to keep that covenant, I was going to keep it. I just knew marriage, his word said. I just knew enough what his word said. It was to death. I just said, okay, Lord. So by the grace of God. But I also saw my mom, how bitter she was. This is what I grew up with. We just knew how to yell and scream at each other, cuss each other out. That's our regular communication. Toxic. And so in her heart for her daughter, she thinks my best interest is I need to divorce my husband. And I just remember I just I yelled at her in my house because she was just saying, You need to do this, you need to divorce him. And I said, Look, I said, I'm making a different choice. I choose to go down the road of forgiveness. I'm not going down the same road you went down. I'm not choosing bitterness. I'm choosing forgiveness. I said, and if you can't support me, if you can't, can't help support me in that situation, then I don't need you in my life right now. That's all I knew what to say. I'm so thankful that God gave me that grace. Because I learned a lot about dying in that process. Nine years standing in the gap for my marriage to be restored. Maybe a little bit more. And I came to the I came to the terms long ago where I said, Lord, I care more about my husband's soul being saved than I care about the marriage being restored. That's what matters. Yeah. Whatever he did, he never chose to divorce me. If he did, I would have I wouldn't have fought it. But I would have chosen to stay unmarried. That was my choice. I was gonna honor my covenant with my God by grace. And somehow I just knew, and then I share this, somehow I just knew, and trust me, I'm just a baby. I'm, I'm 1 Corinthians 3.1. I'm not even that. I just knew there was a higher purpose to what God was doing, and it was painful. I didn't think I could deal with it. So many times I've just been tears crying, Lord, I can't take the rejection. This is too painful. I think I'm going to die. And I could cry many nights in my bed just all night over the rejection. Of just being rejected, tossed aside. So hurt, so wounded. And I remember he would give me a grace. And I would just go through that process and I say, Lord, and I share about my parents because I didn't have that reinforcement in my life. It could only be the love of God that he did something for me special. Because I really believe that. Is I would say, I just know beyond a shadow of a doubt, Lord. This has to be working for my good. You would never, ever do anything to hurt me. Mm -hmm. That's all I could hold on to. Yeah. That was the grace of God because I didn't have anything in the natural growing up in my parents that would have reinforced that in my thought process. Now i got a husband who's loved me, and i got a father who's 
disinherited. I got my brothers who don't want to talk to me. I got everything a mess in my life. And I just knew it was for my good. I didn't know the things I know today. And I say to the Lord, I do it a million times all over again. If that's what it's going to take for me. Because you, he knows what I'm called to. He knows what I need to overcome to become all that he's asking me to be. So he knows. And I'm so thankful. And I count it all joy. I really do. And I really encourage you. Count your trials as joy. Quit grumbling and complaining. Quit being bitter over them. Quit, quit murmuring. Learn to count them all away. Quit seeing the glass half empty. See it half full. See God's goodness in it. See his redemptive plan in it. But if we don't have someone sharing this with us and helping us to know what our suffering is about, what he's qualifying us for. So that's why I say our lives are all going to look different. We all have different things to overcome. He knew what he was going to call me to early on by the grace of God. He put something in me because he knew what he called me to do. And I'm so grateful for that. So this is his plan. Went on a bunny trip. Sorry. He must have wanted you to hear that. <laughs> Be, I hope it encourages you. It's, it's why. We've all got different things to overcome. And it's redemptive. It's redemptive. If we do it his way, that's the key. And I was willing to do it his way. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just willing to die. And that's dying. Most people would not have went through what I went through. They would have. And I believe if I had chosen different things, God would have blessed me. But I would have missed my high call. And he knew I wanted everything. So... He's a good father. His ways are perfect. That's where I was trying to end. Mm -hmm. And remember, the father wants his family back. He wants us restored back to pure, intimate fellowship that Adam and Eve had with him in the garden before the fall. He wants us to know, he wants us to know him first and foremost. Remember Paul said, just to know him. Just to, it doesn't, don't you feel special when someone just, they don't want something from you? Yeah, that's true. That you don't get a call or a text yeah. because someone says, hey, can you be here? Or, hey, God bless Christine, can you pick me up some milk? <laughs> <laughs> but when we, we, we just don't ask something that we just want to be with somebody. Yeah, it's true, it's true. We just want to have fellowship. I just want to know more about you. Yeah. Doesn't that make, mm -hmm. you, how often do we get that time with anybody? So many polls on us. It's true, it is. And so... He first and foremost wants to restore us back. To, he just wants us to know him. And in that process, he wants us to mature into the sons of God. And ultimately, it's because the father is after a bride for his son who will be without spot or wrinkle. Make no mistake. He'll settle for nothing less. So it's under... Understanding the conflict within that we're talking about, the renewal of the mind. Understanding this internal conflict within and the transformation process is vital. If you look up the definition of vital, I did. Because it was the word he kept giving me. I said, Lord, I, I, I kind of think, but I want to know what vital really means. Absolutely necessary. It's required. That's what vital means. Absolutely necessary. It's required. So, if we are to grow and mature, transformation, this process, he wants to restore all things in our life. But we have a lot to say about that by the choices we make. How willing are we to be conformed to his image in word, thought, and deed? How willing are we to die? You know, I, I mentioned it earlier, and I don't mean this as a judgment, I include myself in all this, and I'm often before the Lord. You know, we're really selfish people at large, this church. Very selfish. Very me-oriented. And not the we-oriented. You know, that's a dying too. It isn't necessarily sin. Just dying for selfishness. Putting the needs of someone else above our own. That's a dying too. It isn't always sin. So, Galatians 5.24 says, if does and those who are Christ, who are Christ, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Let go of the temporal. Go on to the eternal that He's called us to. It's way more exciting. It's way more fulfilling. It'll satisfy you. This world yeah. won't satisfy you. Now go, go buy water from Him without price, from the fountain of the water of the life. 
You know, it's nothing we can buy with money, but it'll cost you everything your flesh, if you're willing. So I'm going to just say, lastly, he's knocking on the door of our hearts. Will we open and let him walk in and expose the tears that need uprooting? Are we willing to do it his way? Are we going to keep doing it our way that has failed us time after time after time? We've all been there, right? Yeah. We've been in a rut. There's God, nothing ever changes. We recognize we've been down that road before. So, so are we willing to surrender our will for his? If you answer yes, that will be your choice on between you and the Lord. If you answer yes, it will not be easy. Often it will be hard, it will be painful, it will be full of disappointment, rejection, betrayal. You're going to be misunderstood and judged harshly, and not even so much from unsaved people, but more so from the church. Yeah. Just be forewarned. Often, um, sadly, that's just the way it is, but I promise, they don't promise much, or often, if you say yes, the afflictions we go through will seem as if a moment compared to ruling and reigning with him for all of eternity. You know, as the Lamb's wife, the Revelations 21.9 speaks about the Lamb's wife. Come, let me show you the Lamb's wife. Ah, don't you want to be next to him on the throne? You. I do. This is why he died for us. He wants us to sit next to him on his throne. This promise, again, I will say, is only for the overcomers, the bride who's made herself ready. It's not automatic. You know, the bridegroom is coming back for a bride who's made herself ready without spot or wrinkle. The bride has her role, the consecration. He has his role, sanctifies. We can't do that. Only he can in his Holy Spirit. But truth is a key. Truth is a key. He's not going to settle for anything less than a bride without spot or wrinkle. Nor does he deserve less. And it is, again, I'm going to say, it's all by grace. And grace, one definition of grace can, can be, it's his power and his ability doing it, doing it in us. You know, he's doing, he first gives us the desire, and then he does the work in us. We just, he's just looking for us to say yes to the process. That's all. It's really simple. We make it hard. And it's not easy, and that's why we make it hard. We fight it, right? We fight the process. So that's all he's looking for us is to say yes to the process, to die to self, to exchange our will for his 100% is what he's after. Because he's not going to take anything. He's not going to accept a, a divided heart. You know, what does Jeremiah say in chapter 29? It says, when you seek me with your whole heart you will find me. It doesn't say when you seek me with 50% of your heart, or 10%, or 99.9% it's in your whole heart. That's, that's that relationship. So the choice will be ours. And the last thing I'll just say, that the renewal of our mind, our soul being transformed, is a vital key that we need, that we need to have in order to be ready for our wedding, wedding day. So on that note, that concludes this message. I pray and I hope it's been helpful. I hope maybe it's unraveled some things. And I'm just going to say amen. And you amen. can either say amen, oh no. Or